Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Rachel Thomas, and I'm co-founder of Fast AI and a researcher at the USF Data Institute. I'll be talking about the course Practical Deep Learning for Coders. Um, briefly, my background, I studied math and computer science in undergrad and then did a PhD in pure math. Um, I worked as a quant in energy trading, which is a lot of programming and working with data. And then actually, um, O'Reilly's Strata 2012 was part of what convinced me to switch into tech and become a data scientist. I was a data scientist and back-end engineer at Uber. Um, I taught uh, full-stack software development at an all-woman coding academy, Hackbright. I really love teaching, and I'll always return to it. And then a year and a half ago, Jeremy Howard and I founded Fast AI with the goal of making deep learning more accessible and easier to use. Um, I'm on Twitter at math underscore Rachel, and I blog about data science at fast.ai. I blog about diversity on Medium at Rachel Tho. Yeah, so first, uh, just the vocabulary. Uh, deep learning refers to multi-layered neural networks. It's a very specific class of algorithms that's been given this uh, ambiguous name that overloads two common words. Um, it's a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of AI. And AI is a very broad field, but most of the advances that you hear about happening right now are all coming from deep learning, um, this one family of algorithms. Uh, so examples that you may have used of deep learning are Google Photos. Here I've entered the search term purple flowers, and it's showing me all the pictures I've taken of purple flowers. This is powered by deep learning. Um, this is from um, Analytic, a medical startup that can outperform a panel of expert human radiologists in identifying lung cancer. And then last year, the Chinese tech giant Baidu announced that their deep learning system is better at English and Mandarin speech recognition than most people. Um, so deep learning is being applied a ton right now to working with images and working with natural language. Uh, this is a slide that Jeff Dean of Google Brain shared last year, and it shows the growing use of deep learning at Google. Uh, so the x-axis here is time, going from uh, beginning of 2012 to mid-2016, and the y-axis is the number of unique projects at Google that were using deep learning. And so you can just see this uh, exponential growth. And he lists some of the areas that it was in, and it's deep learning is being applied to drug discovery, Gmail, images, natural language, maps, photos, robots, just this huge variety. And the reason I think this is significant is that Google tends to be ahead of uh, most of us, and so we can expect other companies and other industries to follow this trend of applying deep learning to more and more problems. Um, so to get started, this is from the most popular textbook on deep learning. This is how we can gain intuition for backpropagation through time. Um, so what do you think? Is this intuitive to you? Um, I have a PhD in math, and this is not intuitive to me, nor is it how I gain intuition. Um, and this book, I should say, is a very useful resource, uh, but I don't recommend it as the best place to get started. Um, so a year ago, uh, Jeremy Howard and I decided to create a course, Practical Deep Learning for Coders, that would have no advanced math prerequisites. And so this was very different from how other people were teaching deep learning. Um, we partnered with the University of San Francisco's Data Institute. The course was offered one evening a week. Most people um, in the class were working full time as data scientists or developers. And the only prerequisite was one year of coding experience. Um, we've had ton of success. Uh, one of our students got into the Google Brain residency, who had only been coding for a year. Many others got new job offers, won hackathons, launched companies. Um, so it was, worked really well. Um, we've released all the materials online for free at course.fast.ai, so you can check them out. Um, but yeah, our mo motto is, if you can code, you can do deep learning. And it's all taught in Jupyter Notebooks. And I'll say a little bit more about our kind of education philosophy in a moment. Um, I wanted to tell you the stories of kind of a few of our students and the, just the huge variety of projects that they've worked on. This is Shin Shin Li of Akashi and Exceed. She's developing wearable devices for patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, typically, a doctor would kind of visually assess a patient walking down the hallway to assess how the disease is progressing. A wearable device is going to capture a lot more accurate and more precise data, and they're using deep learning to analyze it. 
This is a team of data scientists, Sarah Hooker's on the far right, um, that's working with Delta Analytics, which pairs nonprofits with teams of data scientists. And this particular team is with Rainforest Connection, which puts recycled cell phones in endangered rainforest, streams audio, and then uses deep learning to identify chainsaw noises. And they have responders they can send out if someone's illegally cutting down the forest. Um, there are a lot of interesting challenges. Apparently, the frequency of chainsaws is the same as the frequency of mosquitoes. Um, but they're having, they're having success with, uh, with deep learning. Uh, these images were sent to me by Sahil Singla, a farm guide in India. And thousands of farmers commit suicide every year in India, um, in large part because they're taking very predatory loans from these thugs that harass them. And the farmers can't prove how much land they own or what type of crops they're growing. So he and his team are scraping publicly available satellite data, applying deep learning to identify the plots of lands, and then creating better um, lending models so that the farmers can um, kind of qualify for better, better loans and insurance. This is Samar Haider, who's a natural language researcher in Pakistan. Um, the main language in Pakistan Urdu is relatively under-resourced. As part of our class, Samar gathered the largest corpus of Urdu text that's been assembled. Um, trained word embeddings on it in the style of Google's word to vec and this is a really useful resource for anyone working with Urdu or translating materials into or out of the language. This, um, and you can start the video, uh, Jacques Mati bought two tons of used Legos on eBay because there's a lucrative um, Lego resale market if you're willing to sort through them to remove the damaged pieces and to find the most valuable shapes. He built a machine to do this for him and uses deep learning for identifying the shapes. <laughs> um, this is, <laughs> this, oh, oops. Uh, this is a picture of Kanye West drawn with miniature Captain Picard heads. Um, this is a new art technique that was invented by Brad Kensler, and he's written a great, great blog post on it. So deep learning is used to create art. <laughs> So uh, Gleb Essman, who works at Splunk, developed a new fraud detection algorithm based off of one of our lessons um, and got a patent for it, and Splunk was very excited. And then um, one of our students, Tim Anglade, worked for the HBO television show Silicon Valley. If you've watched the most recent season, there's an app that can identify if something is a hot dog or not a hot dog, and <laughs> while the, the app is a bit of a joke on the show, Tim actually did a really thorough job building it. He contributed to core TensorFlow as part of the process um, to reduce the size of TensorFlow on Android, and he's done a really great write-up of kind of the technology behind it. Um, and so I share, so this is kind of eight stories of students working on very, very different projects, and it captures, um, I think, the breadth of what, uh, what deep learning can do, or some of that. So about the class, um, so it's all in Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we use a lot of Kaggle competitions because they give you know, good data sources and really clear uh, metrics of kind of what, uh, what good performance is. Uh, we start off with cats versus dogs. Um, this has been a Kaggle competition twice, and it involves getting a set of images and then having to um, determine if they're cats or dogs. So here, the first three are cats, and the fourth image is a dog. So this is from our lesson one notebook. Um, you'll notice we get almost straight to the punchline, a state-of-the-art custom model in six lines of code. And so this captures um, something pretty unique about our teaching philosophy. Um, and this was inspired by David Perkins, um, this idea of the whole game. And he uses an analogy with baseball of we don't require our children to memorize all the formal rules of baseball before we let them play. The kids, you know, they have a sense of the game and they may not be playing a full nine innings or have full teams, uh, but they can play and have fun and as they get older they learn more and more details. Um, and so our goal was to get people using deep learning right away, even though they don't know all the underlying um, uh, kind of techniques or principles, uh, but to get in there and to be applying it to problems they care about, and then over time we drill into the details. Um, also, you'll notice it says state of the art. Um, of the more practical tutorials out there, we had found that many um, were kind of on more toy or sample problems and were settling with good enough results, but we really wanted to get to state of the art. 
Um, there's a student that finished, Andrew Ng just released a new deep learning class, and there's a student that finished it in a week. Um, Andrew Ng tweeted about this. Um, and this is Ar Arvind Nagaraj um, had also taken our course, and he wrote a blog post comparing them, and he recommends them both. And he uses an analogy, though, of base, or not baseball, um, of driving, and says that the fast AI course is like, if you want to learn how to drive a car, we kind of put you behind the wheel right away, and we tell you, like, this is how to hold the steering wheel, and this is how to press the brake and the accelerator. And then, you know, in a few weeks, we start talking about, like, okay, this is how car engines work, and then eventually we're like, okay, and then there's internal combustion. Um, whereas Andrew's course and the traditional model of teaching is much more to start with, okay, this is an internal combustion engine, let's talk about the engineering of the car, and then eventually, then you can drive. Um, so we really have this kind of top-down approach that's um, kind of reverse order from, I think, a lot of, a lot of the teaching I've had. Um, yeah, and then the other thing I would just say about working in Jupyter Notebooks is that it's so great for um, experimenting and prototyping, and I think this is true of most areas of data science, and that includes deep learning. Um, if you haven't done deep learning before, you might think that you need huge clusters of machines, um, but really you could get started on a single GPU. We have an Amazon machine image that we share with students to get them started with one GPU. In part two of the course, we encourage students to build their own box uh, with a $500 GPU um, if they're able to. Uh, but you can really, yeah, get started in a Jupyter notebook um, using an AWS instance pretty easy, relatively easily. <laughs> Uh, this is a quote from a student. I personally fell into the habit of watching the lectures too much and Googling definitions too much without running the code. At first, I thought that I should read the code quickly and then spend time researching the theory behind it. In retrospect, I should have spent the majority of my time on the actual code in the Jupyter Notebooks, running it and seeing what goes into it and what comes out of it. Um, this is really good advice. Um, it's not by listening or watching that you learn, it's by doing. Um, and so it's so important to be changing the inputs and seeing how that modifies the outputs and writing code yourself. And Jupyter Notebooks are a really great environment for that. Uh, this is uh, some more of lesson one. Um, I'd say it's really good to be able, in any sort of data science, to look at your data to see what it looks like, what are you getting wrong or right. Um, and Deep learning is often being applied to images or video or audio, and Jupyter Notebooks give you a really great way to look at this data. And so here we can look at the dogs um, and kind of to remember that the alternative to this would either be um, kind of doing something in the terminal and then having all these other windows open of maybe you have a separate image viewer and maybe a separate PDF with some law tech, uh, but to really have this all in one coherent narrative um, I think is, is wonderful. Um, Oh, and I also, I just want to highlight on this slide that the, uh, um, so we, we recommend using transfer learning, and that's a big focus of the course, and this is where you take a pre-trained model from someone that probably has a lot more data than you and a lot more computational power, and you retrain just the last few layers to fine-tune it to your problem. And here we're doing that with ImageNet, which is, um, involves a thousand categories, and so it's identified this first dog as being very llama-like, which I think is accurate, and then we go on to kind of uh, fine-tune this to actually predict cat or dog. This is from a later lesson using the Kaggle Fisheries Competition, which was involved identifying the species of different fish. Um, and this is something that can help prevent or identify overfishing of endangered species. And so in the top picture, this is taken from above. So you'll see on the, you're looking down on a, the floor of a boat on the left, and then the water's on the right, and the fish that's been caught is near the top of the picture. Here we've overlaid that with a um, heat map showing the activations of the neural network, and you can see where it's most active. There's kind of this bright pink spot that's on top of the fish. And so this is a neat insight into kind of what the, the neural network is doing of you're like, it's activated in the area where the fish is. Um, and also Jupyter Notebook gives us this nice way to kind of display that and look at it. So this is stochastic gradient descent. It's a core, um, core part of training neural networks. Um, and so I think this video, which was created with the animation module from Matplotlib, um, gives a really accurate kind of picture of it. So we've got a 
line of, or we've got these points that are trying to find a line of best fit. And we start off with a random guess, which is not great. And then we're taking steps generally in the right direction. So there's some randomness. It's not necessarily getting better each time. Um, but overall, our line is headed, uh, headed in the right direction. Um, this is a good illustration of SGD. I wanted to recognize my favorite Jupiter extension, which is collapsible headings. These make it a lot easier to navigate very large notebooks and to keep them organized. Um, the keyboard shortcuts are really uh, terrific with this. When you're in command mode within a section, left takes you to the top of the section, right takes you to the bottom. And then on a section heading, left uh, folds it up, right unfolds it. And they've, they've made it much easier to kind of produce these um, you know, like textbooks inside Jupyter Notebooks and to stay organized with different headings and subheadings. Uh, much easier to navigate around. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank everyone that contributes to Jupyter Notebooks. Um, they've definitely changed how I do my own work as a data scientist, as well as how I teach um, in, a, in a huge direction for the better. Um, and I wanted to say, I was just talking today about practical deep learning for coders. That's one of our um, courses, but we have three courses at Fast AI that are all available completely for free online, all taught within Jupyter Notebooks, all taught with this top-down teaching philosophy I described of kind of getting you in the driver's seat right away and then digging into the details later. Um, there's a part two, cutting edge deep learning for coders that involves reading and implementing um, cutting edge research. And then there's a computational linear algebra class I taught this summer. If you took a linear algebra course in college, this is very different um, because a typical linear algebra class is focused on um, doing matrix computations by hand. Uh, computational linear algebra is focused on how do we get computers to do this uh, quickly and with enough accuracy, and that's a whole different set of considerations. Um, I should also note, uh, if you live in the Bay Area, we'll be doing another version of the in-person practical deep learning for coders um, with the updated version of the course that starts in late October, and you can find information online about it. Um, so yeah, again, thank you, and feel free to reach out to me on Twitter um, or in person at this conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.